to start this talk off a little differently. I'm going to be reading from a book that I left in my apartment in New York City. So I have made one out of paper just for this occasion. Uh, the book is A Brief History of Time by Stephen Hawking. And he kicks off this book with a little bit of a vignette that I'd like to share with you. So a well-known scientist once gave a public lecture on astronomy. She described how the Earth orbits around the sun and how, in turn, the sun orbits around the center of a vast collection of stars called our galaxy. At the end of the lecture, a man, it was definitely a man, at the back of the room got up and said, what you have told us is rubbish. The world is really a flat plate supported on the back of a giant tortoise. Hmm. Much like a Reddit comment, basically. Uh, <laughs> And so the scientist paused, but then gave kind of a superior smile. Uh, and she said, well, well, what is the tortoise standing on? She asked the man. <laughs> You're very, very clever, young lady, said the man. But it's turtles all the way down. <laughs> so potentially you've heard that story before. Um, and you also might think that the idea of our universe being a ton of tor tortoises in some sort of tower um, and you also might be wondering, you know, why, why is she talking about space? Why are we questioning this idea of the universe? And so this is kind of an intro to something that I'd like you to be thinking about. We've done a lot of very practical coding today, which is super cool. Uh, there are only two code slides in this talk, uh, and I'm not going to talk very much about them. So this is a little bit more about the code for your computer up here. Um, now, of course, yes, turtles, space, and you're probably wondering, what the heck does this have to do with JavaScript? Uh, and I assure you, we'll get there. But it's going to take a second. So hi, my name is Ashley Williams. I'm known as AG Dubs on Twitter. Uh, if you follow me, I'm sorry. If you don't, I don't recommend it. Um, <laughs> I tweet way too much. Uh, and as Remy said, I work at this company, yes, it's a company, called MPM, which how many people here have heard of it? All right, I'm not going to ask you what you think of it, because I assume you all think it's awesome. Um, so uh, my job at this company is kind of funny. Basically, my job is to explain NPM. So if you don't understand how NPM works, that's my problem. And it does turn out that lots of people don't know. So I spend a lot of time explaining. And then every once in a while, I get to do a lot of work um, on some of the back end services, or I get to kind of help product to make it so that NPM is maybe a little easier to explain. Uh, that being said, I spend a lot of time doing open source development. Uh, I am a developer, but I'm not really a terribly good front-end developer, and I have the sense that I am surrounded by people who are much better. Uh, this is some front-end code that I wrote when I was writing these slides. Uh, it did exactly what it said it was going to do. Um, so, yeah. Uh, if you would like a reminder that I work at NPM, you can NPM install AG Dubs, and it will simply tell you that I work at NPM. Uh, but probably more relevantly, if you'd like the contents of these slides, you can NPM install a brief history. Since I was talking about modules and packages, I was like, it'd be cute to like make it a package. Uh, I also just made a short link for it, because this is going to be a lot easier. I don't think you can NPM install things on your phone. If any of you have, let me know, because that's probably really cool. All right. Uh, we have one person. <laughs> um, additionally, if you're the type of person who sees a typo on a slide and literally can't even focus for the rest of the talk because you saw one typo, uh, they're on GitHub. PR's welcome. Just go for it. Uh, yeah. Which, somebody actually made a PR yesterday. It was delightful. So I think it's on you to give me at least one. Um, OK. So I like to kick off my talks by saying that I like to think about thinking. And I really like to think about the type of thinking that happens when people write code. And maybe this is because in my formative years in college, instead of studying any computer science at all, instead I double majored in philosophy and neuroscience. Um, but it's also just kind of because I like kind of goofy infinite regresses like this. Uh, this is existential comics, and it says, why read philosophy? Because it isn't enough to just have ideas. You should also know why you have the ideas you have. And this is going to be a theme of today. All right. So I have been uh, traveling around the world uh, teaching beginners a lot. And one of the reasons I love teaching beginners is because I fundamentally believe that teaching beginners is the absolute best way to cement your own knowledge. Uh, how many teachers are there in the room? There's more than yesterday, but there are still not enough. 
So this is kind of like a personal slogan of mine, that teaching is nature's way of letting you know how sloppy your thinking is. Uh, and I can guarantee you that your, your thinking is definitely more sloppy than you realize until you start trying to explain something to someone. But as I said, I have been going around the world teaching beginners Node. Uh, this is when we were in London a couple of months ago. Uh, and I've been doing this with this program called Node Together. Uh, so this is a shameless plug for my uh, free program for teaching people Node. But part of the reason I bring this up is because one of the things that happens when you teach beginners is you get these questions that are somehow like extremely naive, yet also equally extremely profound. So one of the questions that I've gotten was this question, which is amazing. How did you get permission to publish a module on NPM? So to, to people who maybe who have published modules, anybody has published a module? Yeah, more than yesterday as well, excellent. If you don't know how to get permission to publish the NPM, let me, let me know and I'll help you out with that. Um, but one of the things that goes beyond this question, once you kind of figure out, okay, maybe I wanna publish a package or maybe I just wanna separate my code out from a single file, is this next question, which is how do you decide what goes in a module? Now, this is kind of one of those questions where it's like, have you ever really looked at your hands? But this is what we're gonna do for the next 40 <laughs> minutes. Um, you're gonna really, really look at the concept of modularity. Uh, so, as an excellent academic researcher, and by the way, people confuse, were confused yesterday. I'm joking, I'm not an academic researcher. And you can, I hope you can tell because when I do my research, the first thing I do is I go to Twitter. Um, and so I just tweeted, I was like, okay, what's your primary motivation for writing or using modular code? And I gotta tell you, there were a lot of people with a lot of opinions. It's got a lot of response. I screenshotted it right after I tweeted it. I know that it looks like low engagement, but it was pretty high. <laughs> yeah. Anyways, so one of the big things that people talked about was that they felt like modularity was something that allowed them to make more maintainable code. And they often actually didn't use the word maintainable, but they talked about the discipline of being able to test modular code. They were really focused on the fact, you know, when you break up your code, you're able to test it. And this is something we'll get back to, but this was one of the most common responses. Another response was from Bradley Ferris, who I gave his own slide, even though the slide doesn't look super balanced, because if you care about modularity or JavaScript, you should care about ES6 modules, and he is the hero right now behind that. So you should look up what those are and you should look into the work he's doing, because it's awesome, and it will change how you have to write code. Um, but he was like, okay, so I, write, I use modules so I don't write things that my past self did that my future self will need. And that was, that was pretty good, that was an okay answer. And then of course, because I asked Twitter, there were trolls. Um, some classic trolls here. Uh, Gary Bernhardt requires no introduction. Um, but then Jan Lenhart was like, I'll make modules so that you're like, you know, make their NPM install longer. And I was like, thanks, Jan. Great. Um, uh, but what I think was really interesting is most people talked about packages needing, needing to be for reuse um, and separation of concerns, you know, do one thing well. And I was like, okay, that's a cool answer, but I don't think it really, really answers my question. So like, how do you decide what those single concerns actually are. And people really did not deal with this question well. Uh, this person suggested that they just kind of used intuition. Uh, when I pressed this person, they were like, I throw darts? I hope other people have better strategies. And then it turned out that like really people didn't. And even the person who I learned JavaScript from, reading eloquent JavaScript, Martin Haverbeek, uh, awesome book by the way, uh, he kind of was like, oh, you know the question where to split, maybe, and, but by the time he was done writing this little tweet storm, he was like, you know, I don't know. There's a lot of things that go into this, and this is actually a really hard question. Uh, this, though, was by far the best answer. <laughs> so, how many people had someone get mad at you when you just put it all in one file? All right, you're all liars. <laughs> because we've all done this. Uh, but this seemed to be the most, the most honest answer. And so we, from this answer, you kind of get the idea that like we do modularity because people, people want us to. Maybe you could argue they don't want merge conflicts, but it's probably a little bit more than that. But we can say that modularity is something that people really like, but they haven't really thought that much about. So I'm a big weirdo, and so I saw this and I was like, whoa, I think modularity is kind of like the concept of time. 
and like everyone's like, oh God, where did she get this from? This doesn't make any sense. But I promise, it will, it will make a little sense by the time I'm done. Um, and so this is why. It's because if you ask somebody, hey, you know, like, what time is it? They'll kind of look at their, their watch and they'll be like, 3 p.m. All right, and similarly, if I showed you all this lovely store, which is next to Madison Square Garden, you might go, that store is doing a little too much. <laughs> yeah, that's a real, I've never been inside, but it's real. Um, but then again, so uh, on the surface, they seem kind of obvious. We can kind of have this intuition of it. But then if you like ask someone, all right, well, it's 3 p.m., but like what is time? All right, you're gonna get a response like this, like I don't know. Uh, and it's similar with modularity, like what is modularity? All right, so uh, this is why I have themed this talk with a brief history of time, also because I'm kind of a physics nerd. All right, so to kick off my deep dive into modularity, I wanted to get a picture of our universe. Um, and so when I'm thinking about JavaScript and I'm thinking about packages and I'm also thinking about how I get paid every month, uh, I think that the universe, at least for modularity when we think about it, is a bit with the NPM registry. And so this is a really cool video that uh, somebody did. They've done several visualizations of the NPM registry, but they dropped uh, uh, the, uh, the registry data into a graph database. And to get us into the space mood, this is outer space as imagined from the MPM registry. This is the Lodash galaxy. <laughs> Pretty cool. But when we think about this being our universe, we, there's so many things going on here. Um, and thinking about exploring it like space seemed like a kind of fun concept to me. We'll, we'll wait till we get to like the Babel React circles and then, oh, ES6 Promise RxJS file. Here we go. Here we go. The circles of Babel and React. <laughs> So this is a, a fun visualization and uh, kind of get us in the mood. Uh, but the NPM registry, if you think about packages and you think about modularity, this is a, a really, really big one. Um, so I took this yesterday, so these numbers are all wrong now. Uh, but the NPM registry has somewhere around 368 probably now total packages. Um, and we get 6 billion downloads in the last month. That's, that's pretty big. Uh, and we're not just big in general, we're also big relative to all of the other module registries. Um, so you can see here, like we got, even RubyGems is not even, is in second place, but it's still not even close to how many packages and modules that we're dealing with. So NPM is the largest module repository in the world. And obviously for the theme, I'm gonna say the universe, maybe. I don't know, someone suggested that maybe aliens have Git yesterday on Twitter. I was like, I don't know. Um, and so this is cool, and this will be the last awesome thing I say about yeah, yeah, NPM. Um, but if we're thinking about this, the scale of the modularity that we're talking about with the NPM registry is, is epic, and I kind of want to know why. Like, why? Why are we doing all this modularity? Particularly when I can ask a bunch of like, extremely well-known developers on Twitter and they don't really have an answer. Um, we can all agree that like our idea is like let's modularize all the thing, but again, let's let's try and figure out where this like explosion of enthusiasm is coming from and decide whether or not it really makes sense. So why so many modules? So this would not be a good computer science talk if I didn't do a Dijkstra quote. So here we go. Get ready. Um, this is an awesome paper that he wrote called On the Cruelty of Really Teaching Computer Science. So if you ever felt pain in those classes, he's confirming that for you. Um, so he says, the programmer is in the unique position. They have to be able to think in terms of conceptual hierarchies that are much deeper than a single mind ever needed to face before. The automatic computer, right, lol, the automatic computer, oh my god. Um, the automatic computer <laughs> confronts us with a radically new intellectual challenge that has no precedent in our history. Now, I am not the biggest fan of you know, software engineers exceptionalism, but I do think that there is a point here that certainly when we're doing programming, particularly now as we've moved up these trees of abstractions up to web development, we are dealing with extremely deep conceptual hierarchies. And to a certain extent, modularity is our way of addressing that conceptual challenge, to address that complexity. All right, so now we can say, okay, we kind of know what problem we're solving, but like, what is modularity? So my research skills are gonna kick in again, and I went to Wikipedia to get a definition. 
Um, so Wikipedia defines modular programming as a software design technique that emphasizes separating the functionality of a program into independent, interchangeable modules, such that each contains everything necessary to execute only one aspect of the desired functionality. And so if you've been following my questioning, you're probably going to know that I'm going to take a little bit of an issue with this idea of one aspect. All right, how do we decide which aspect? All right, and this brings me to the small modules philosophy. Has anyone heard these words, this word salad before? Small modules philosophy? All right, yesterday I felt like I was making it up, and everyone was like, we have no idea what that is. All right, so if you don't know, it turns out that the words also describe what it is. Um, but <laughs> uh, that being said, um, somebody who has written a lot of packages on NPM, does a lot of open source, singular. Uh, he says, it's all about containing complexity. By making small focused modules, you can easily build large complex systems without having to know every single detail of how everything works. Our short term memory is finite. All right, so this is kind of going back to this idea. We've got intense amounts of complexity, but also as human beings, as software developers, we actually can't hold all that complexity in our brains. So let's use small modules as a way of being able to focus on individual things so that we are able to contain that complexity and then build larger systems from that. All right, now inevitably when small modules philosophy comes up, there's this question, well, well how small is too small? Like, how small can we go with packages? All right, and so uh, Cinder has an AMA, and somebody had asked this question. It was like, lots of people don't get the benefits of one-line modules. What would you say to those who tend to critique a lot of node modules that just have one line in them? Now, this module didn't have just one line, but I imagine that there's at least a few people in the audience who might be thinking about this. <laughs> so we're gonna talk about this, but first, as a warning, if you have a left pad joke, you should tell someone other than me it. Um, in fact, you should tell literally anyone besides anybody who works at NPM, because that was actually an extremely brutal moment. Um, so yeah, it's, it wasn't that funny. That being said, I think there's a lot of interesting things that we can learn from it. So for those of you who don't know, left pad is a relatively small module that existed on the NPM registry, and then for a very brief moment, literally one hour, it didn't exist there. And when it didn't exist for that brief moment, people lost their minds. Um, so this is the media, and the media said that we broke the internet. Uh, what's fascinating to me is the dramatic images we got here. Look at this. <laughs> this is like TNT drama. It's amazing, all right? Uh, they also couldn't agree on how long, like how many lines the actual package had, but it was important that they try and guess. Um, this is the package. Uh, this, is the one, this is a small bit of code. And while the media's response saying, like, oh, the internet broke was very irritating to me, I was actually way more upset by some of the other people. All right, so this is Aaron Hammer, who you might know from the Happy Framework. He wrote, the fact that LeftPad is a module and the other people require it is a real breakdown in common sense. It's completely ridiculous, I guess, that we, we had used this module. And then, then someone went as far to say, LeftPad? We've all forgotten how to program. This is completely, completely ridiculous. And I, I want to take this moment just to say, like, all right, abstraction is definitely an awesome power that we have as developers, but when we use it, it doesn't mean that we forgot how to program. All right, did we forget to pro program when we stopped writing C? When we stopped writing assembly? How many assembly programmers here? PS, try it, it's actually really fun. Um, it's tedious, but it's fun. Um, or maybe when we stop doing electrical engineering. I have to write doing electrical engineering because I don't know the name of what you would be doing if you were doing that. <laughs> I don't know. That's not what I do. All right. Does that make me not a programmer? All right. I'm sick. I'm sick of this argument of like no true programmer. This is stupid. All right. It's a no true Scotsman fallacy if we want to get into it. All right. But the idea of no true programmer, like do not come barking around me with that. And I would strongly recommend that if you've thought that that's a real thing, maybe don't. Maybe don't do that. Um, unless, I guess, you're an electrical engineer who's like the person who wrote assembly or something like this. Um, because levels of abstraction do not define what you are doing. Um, okay, so 
With left pad, okay, how small is really too small? I think Substack says this best. And for people who don't know Substack, if you are using anything on NPM, I can basically guarantee that you're using code that he's written, because um, he's very prolific. Uh, but he describes uh, what he thinks application code should really look like. And so he says, when applications are done well, they are just the really application-specific brackish residue that can't be so easily abstracted away. All the nice reusable components sublimate away onto GitHub and NPM, where everyone can collaborate to advance the commons. So I'll quickly say, I love this idea of advancing the commons, like communism all the way down. This is my politics, not Substack, by the way, but I'm really into it. Um, but what I love about this is like what he's saying is to ask how small the module should be like doesn't actually make sense. We should be thinking about what should be in our application code. And what he says here is it should be the application specific code. So I guess if you were writing an application where you really just needed to take some spaces and put them on a string, specifically on the left side, then yes, using left pad would probably, like as a package, like probably wouldn't make any sense. But I'm pretty sure that like most people aren't writing that application. So using that package seems completely reasonable because that code is not specific to your application. All right, so again, left pad made us all very nervous about sharing code. It made people very, everyone was like, I'm gonna vendor all my node modules. And I was like, that's a terrible idea. Have you seen the size of that folder? It's big. Um, and they're like, I don't trust anything. But in the end, like, yes, the commons are hard, but the commons are also really, really good. And this number continues to go up. This is the rolling weekly downloads of NPM packages. And it's kind of hard to deny that using modularity and packages in this way has been very successful, and particularly successful for growing a community. Uh, so this brings me kind of to this kind of awesome person, and I'm very excited to be quoting him because he's actually a pediatrician. And how many tech conferences do you go to where people are like, this pediatrician knows a lot about computers, and, but he actually does. Uh, he wrote this amazing book called Systemantics, and I think the subtitle is really telling, where he says it's about how systems work, but especially about how they fail. And so the reason that I think this is really interesting is he actually wrote this book looking at emergency rooms uh, and what worked for them and what didn't. But I think it's very, very specific to also how we build software. This is what he says. He says, a complex system that works is invariably found to have evolved from a simple system that worked. A complex system designed from scratch never works and it cannot be patched up to make it work, though we may try as software developers. All right, he says, you have to start over with a simple system. And so this kind of harkens back to the idea when people were talking about modularity and their ability to test. They're already thinking, I have a complex thing that I need to do, but I need to make sure that I have small little building blocks that work, and those are those simple things. And being sure that they work is, how they, is by testing them. All right, so this brings up our new question now. All right, yeah, I'm doing turtles for the theme, you know. If you're bored, just look at the turtle. Uh, anyways, but now we have this question, okay, now we need simple pieces to build these complex projects. But what the heck is simplicity? And so I'm actually gonna look at two concepts here, both simplicity and information, because I think when we're thinking about these small building blocks, we're thinking about simplicity and information. Now these ideas are kind of like high in the sky kind of stuff, and what I like is that I think we can actually bring them back to kind of a more physical definition. So this is one of many times Rich Hickey is gonna appear in this talk, uh, because I'm really into him. If you don't know who he is, he's uh, done Clojure, um, the programming language. So in, in his talk, Simple Made Easy, uh, he defines the term simple from its etymology for simplex, which means a single fold. All right, so when we think about something simple, we think about it as just a single fold, so just like this. And then if we're thinking about complex, we would think about many folds. And so what we can understand is that it would take a lot more information to describe something that had many folds as opposed to something that just had one. And this is a physical way that we can kind of think about what simplicity is. Now we have to ask ourselves, well, what the heck is information? Because now it's like, okay, how much information does it take to describe a system? And so this brings me to an author named Cesar Hidalgo who wrote this amazing, amazing book called Why Information Grows. Now the book is actually about why order in the universe can deteriorate even as it grows on Earth, which is totally out of the scope of this talk. But if you want to know about it, you should talk to me at the party. No one has taken me up on this yet, and I'm bummed about it. Anyways, 
all right? So in his book, he defines information as this. He says, information is not a thing. Rather, it is the arrangement of physical things. It is physical order, like what distinguishes different shuffles of a deck of cards. What is surprising to most people, however, is that information is meaningless. Okay, so what the heck does this have to do with all of my talks about modularity right now? And so it's, it's a very subtle inversion of kind of what we've been talking about, all right? We've been talking about what do you put in a module, but what I want us to kind of shift that to is thinking that we have a piece of software and how do we slice it? Let's think more about our software as a physical arrangement instead of pieces of content, all right? And with this, I am now going to problematize <coughs> modularity, as Remy had told us all that he, I would. All right, so there's a person named Nolan Lawson. Uh, he's awesome, and he wrote a blog post called The Cost of Small Modules. Has anyone here read it? All right, spoiler alert. Um, so he kicks this blog post off by saying, the more I modularize my code, the bigger it gets. And so this is obviously said in frustration. If we're writing things in small pieces, why the heck now we're feeling a sense of bloat. And then he follows up by quoting Sam Sacon saying, over 400 milliseconds is being spent simply walking my browserify tree. Which for him is he's saying, this is a really long time. This is kind of absurd. All right, and so, so no Nolan wrote this blog post and he called it the cost of small modules and I got immediately into it. Not just because I like work at NPM so it's like relevant and maybe he was like dissing us. Uh, no, I actually just got really into it because he announced it like this. He said, alternative title, why one horse-sized JavaScript duck is faster than 100 duck-sized JavaScript horses. And I was like, I must draw it. <laughs> and that's what happened. <laughs> Um, but how many people here have uh, horse-sized JavaScript ducks? How many people have a lot of duck-sized JavaScript horses? All right, a lot of people didn't vote. That's fine. Um, <laughs> but generally, maybe you just, they're not animal people, I guess. Um, all right, so this, this is something that kind of goes in the face of like the common ideology, which is to like make everything into tiny pieces, make it in microservices, let's make it into all these tiny little modules. Um, and so he looked at how many modules were in a typical web application, and we can see that going from require bin down to apple.com, we're somewhere between 100 modules and 1,000 modules. Now realize now when I'm saying modules, I don't necessarily mean packages. And also, if you're talking about a package, realize that a package is not necessarily just one module. There's plenty of packages that have four, maybe even five like modules inside them. Lodash is an excellent example, it has a lot of modules in it. Um, so he looked at this, and then he looked at the bundling abilities um, of several, several package bundlers. So we have Browserify, Webpack, uh, the Google Closure Compiler, and Rollup. Now, I was told that you're not supposed to talk about libraries at this conference, so I'm not going to. Here's the key differences. With Webpack and Browserify, when they bundle, they preserve the modularity, which means that every module gets its own function. Alternatively, Rollup and Clojure get rid of that modularity that you're using in development, and they hoist all of those things up into a single function. And so here's where the interesting part happens, is that it turns out when we think about packages, we think about how big they are, how long it takes to request them. But what we don't realize is that by preserving the modularity that was helping us in the development period, we actually are costing our users in runtime. Because looking up all of those scopes is expensive. So it turns out that this modularity thing that we really like is actually not so hot for our users. And this is a cost that we rarely look at and we rarely talk about, all right? So as I was saying before, it's not about what the modules contain. It's about how we slice them and it's also about how we put them back together, all right? So Rich Harris says this, he says, yes, small modules are easy to write, all right? They're easier to test. It's easier to adhere to Semver. These are all things that make your life as a library author easier. But as we've just seen, they come at a cost for others. All right, so when we think about the small modules philosophy, all right, it benefits the library writers, it disadvantages application writers, and it harms end users. And this is the cost that I want us to point out. 
All right, so how the heck did we end up here? This seems brutal. And so this is a philosopher of scientists, that, uh, a science that I really like to quote a bunch. And he says, scientists work from models acquired through education and exposure to literature, often without quite knowing or needing to know what characteristics have given these models the status of community paradigms. So modularity, I think we all kind of decided like, yeah, it's good, but we have not taken a lot of time to really look at it, all right? And it turns out that these, time, these costs are not, the, yeah, this is the BART. This is the most BART photo ever. Um, it's the, it's the, the tube in San Francisco. Uh, these are not just inconveniences. Those costs I showed were actually just on a desktop browser. When you move that lookup time onto something that has like low connectivity and the network um, and a smaller processor, like in a mobile phone, those costs are real. They're really big costs. And so this is like when I break to bring up our now CTO, Siegebot, uh, at NPM. She says this. She's like, yeah, your monolith is complex. But you know that split system that's like super hot right now? That split system is more complex. And it's like, uh-oh. I guess our solution to dealing with complexity, like maybe it's worse than the problem that we were solving, um, which is kind of brutal. All right. And so, I don't think it's all that terrible. And again, here's our Rich Hickey. Uh, he says, most of the biggest problems in software are problems of misconception. And that is why there is no code in this talk, because I want to talk about the concepts. All right, and so what I want to say is I think when we think about software development, I don't think we think about it right. The vast majority of software development is change management. All right, we and I was asking people why they used modularity. Nobody talked about their software changing. They all looked at it statically, all right? And so what's funny is that this misconception actually happened for Stephen Hawking, too. And this happened when people were thinking about the universe. He wrote, it's an interesting reflection on the general climate of thought before the 20th century that no one had suggested that the universe was expanding or contracting. People were trying to make a picture of the universe to try and describe it scientifically, but in no way did they conceive of it being able to change. And so if you're actually trying to describe a system or talk about the best practices or how it works, you need to realize that you're talking about a dynamic system and not a static one. All right, and so this is kind of the long, drawn out punchline because obviously I wanted to write a talk about modularity. So instead of just asking on Twitter, I actually asked Google Scholar, how do you put stuff in a module? And I got this amazing paper back, which is literally the answer. It says, on the criteria to be used in decomposing systems into modules. Perfect. Amazingly, though, there's not much else beyond this paper. Uh, and this paper is by uh, a computer scientist named David Parnas. And so here's what he recommends. He says, start with a list of difficult design decisions or design decisions which are likely to change. Each module is then designed to hide such decisions from the others. And this is, this is the difference, all right? The goal of modularity is not to make things easier for us as developers, all right? The goal is to hide the things that are hard. That's what we're trying to do, all right? So now I've done this thing, and it's like, oh gosh, like maybe I've potentially change a little bit about how you're thinking about doing modularity. How do we move on from this? All right, and so again, none of us are known, like, or none of us are born knowing how to write software. All right, and even Cinder in his AMA is like, you know what, I try this a lot, um, and sometimes I make mistakes, and, and that's okay. There's obviously not like a necessarily right answer. And just because I say, oh, you should put this stuff in modules that is going to change, um, that's not like obviously going to be prescribing to you exactly how to do something. And so I do want to say that maybe I've just insulted all of your intuitions, but intuition is actually pretty cool. And so as a short little story, I'll say, all is not lost, dogs know calculus. Did you know this? Literally, dogs know calculus, all right? So there's this professor who owns a bunch of corgis, which is awesome, and he was watching his corgis fetch tennis balls one day, and he was like, wow, uh, when they run across different surfaces of different textures, the corgi can calculate, based on his running speed, which surface he runs faster on, and then decide to turn just right at the exact time so he can get to the ball the fastest. And he's really accurate. Like, really good. Okay, so I did do a lot of insulting of our intuitions, but like, okay, corgis are made of star stuff, there's intuition and stuff, so we shouldn't feel absolutely terrible, all right? Um, our intuitions aren't completely wrong, all right? Shout out to corgis. Um, but 
potentially, when you think about a lot of the conceptions around computer science and how to build software, you may feel despair. How many people have ever felt despair when programming? OK, there we go. Yes. Um, so we'll bring in a little existentialism for us right here. So every line of code is written without reason, maintained out of weakness, and deleted by chance. Jean-Paul Sartre's ANSI programming in C. Um, no, that's, that's not actually really him. This is actually my friend Tef. And uh, my friend Tef actually has some other really good practical advice for breaking stuff into modules. And it also kind of turns a little bit of stuff on its head. He says, we should be writing code that is easy to delete, not easy to extend. Instead of building reusable software, we should try to build disposable software. And he goes on to say, I don't need to tell you that deleting code is more fun than writing it. And if you love it, you should do it every day. Um, deleting code is amazing. Um, so this idea of we should be splitting our code to isolate the hard to write parts, the likely to change parts, and then keeping those separated from each, each other also makes it a lot easier for us to be able to remove that code completely. Oftentimes when we're modularizing things, we will actually couple things more closely together, particularly if those things are rapidly changing. And so realizing that what we really want to be doing is just deleting all the code can help us not be modularizing things in a way that increases coupling. So I'm going to end with this, because I love space, and I've been throwing all sorts of wrenches into this talk. So now I'm going to be like, OK, what the heck is space time? All right, so the definition of space time refers to whatever external reality underlies our collective experiences of the space between things and the time between events. So this is a definition that uses the word in the definition, so it's tautological and doesn't really make any sense. Um, that being said, what is space time is actually not what I was interested in. What I really was interested in is, okay, why not just time? Like, why not just space? Why do we need this extra concept? Why do we need this concept of space time? And the reason, it, the practical reason, is actually because you can have two observers moving at relative speeds to each other, and they can't agree on how much time passes between events, they can't agree on how much space is covered, and they can't even agree on the chronological order of events. Yet, they are both right. So think about this next time somebody tries to tell you that like React is the best framework or something, all right? We actually can't agree on space or time. Uh, and what this means is that what you really need to be doing is we really just actually need to be just paying a bit more attention to the concepts that we let guide us when we are programming, all right? Like, what is time is a tough question, and it's not even the full question. So when I'm asking us what is modularity, I'm probably leaving a bunch of stuff out. And the call to action here, really, is like modularity is an old problem, but in JavaScript, we're dealing with it at a brand new scale. And this scale is very hard to think about. And so I believe that we really need new and better ways to see these implications of modularity. I'd like to see us be able to visualize this more. Um, and I want to be able to see it both in space, as in how much you know, it takes for the network to download all of this stuff, but also in time. I'd really like to see how we modularize code as a code base changes over time. And I think being able to look at that is going to really be able to influence our practices in building software. All right, so I want to leave you with this. This is our, our lovely Julia Evans, who everyone got mad at for putting it in one file. She says, the more programming I do, the more things I run into where I don't know, Google doesn't know, my colleagues don't know, but we got to do it anyways. And I feel like this is also a lot of my experiences in programming, too. And she, she comforts us, though. She says, when this happens, I think, right. This is why they pay a human with a brain who can investigate and learn. Uh, so thank you very much. If you want those sources, NPM install a brief history. Uh, this has been awesome. Look out for the turtles. Thank you.